just so scared. She was just there on the floor. My dad was over her, like, throttling her. I was passing out. I could feel myself going. He wasn't losing his grip. What? Sorry. She was thrown down the stairs by him um, with my little sister in her arms, and she was only four weeks old at the time. For that one reason, I will never forgive him. You make me like this! He hit her across the head with a spanner a few times. I remember my mum screaming, and I remember the bath filling up with quite a lot of blood. I'm Alicia Dixon. I witnessed my mother suffer domestic violence between the ages of eight and ten. Come on. I've never spoken Ready? about the experience Jump. until now, 21 years later. And I still feel uncomfortable doing Go. it. But I know there are thousands of children suffering far worse than I did on a daily basis. So Crazy. it's for them that I've found my voice. Back. When I was eight, my mum's partner at the time started to emotionally and physically abuse her. She'd give my brother and I excuses for the bruises and black eyes and sometimes we would hear the arguments and fights from the stairs. One day specifically, I remember coming home and my mum had a black eye and it was like nothing I'd seen before. And uh, she said, I said, oh, you know, I kind of knew how it happened, so that couldn't have been the first time because I knew that it happened and she said she fell and she banged her, her head on the cupboard. But I know that that wasn't the first time because I knew straight away that it was her partner that had done that to her. So there must have been incidents before that. Um, but that, that one always stands out because the fact that it was so obvious and the fact that she gave me this blatant lie. Ready? Go. As a child, I often felt helpless in the knowledge that my mum was being abused. To the outside world, life went on as normal and we simply smiled, put a brave face on it and carried on. I believe that hasn't changed for other children living with domestic violence today. I think it's going on right under our noses, and yet we don't tend to see it. We go about our busy lives whilst it continues to cross thousands of thresholds across the UK, regardless of age, class, race or religion. I'm not sure I really understand how living with domestic violence as a child has affected me in the long term. All I do know is that I wouldn't be the person I am now without having experienced it. Come, Rox. When you're young and you see your mum being abused, or your dad, you know, I can't just presume it's all mums, you feel helpless. You feel weak. You feel useless, like you can't do anything. You know, to have to stand there and allow it to happen and not being old enough or physically strong enough or mentally mature enough to handle it, that's, that's frustrating and that's, that's the part of it, I think, that builds up in a lot of people and they become aggressive and angry because they didn't know how, don't know how to channel it. And some people channel it in the right way and some people channel it in the wrong way. I'd hate to think that I was ever aggressive towards other people, um, but it definitely made me quite insecure. I think that's the thing that stands out the most for me is not having that feeling of security. And I believe every child has the right to grow up in an environment where they feel secure and fearless going into the world. And I suppose I didn't really feel that. So I was quite, and, and, and because I'm quite a loud character and because I'm quite extrovert, but I think people when I was younger always presumed I'd be really confident, but actually I was lacking in it. And a lot of the time I was pretending to be confident, pretending to be really hard so nobody would pick on me at school. But actually, I was quite scared of everything. Even scared to get on the train and go into London and just scared to pick up the telephone and make an inquiry. I was quite scared and had a lot of fears about a lot of things. And I wonder if it, if it comes from not having that sense of security as a child. And it's something I've had to work on and I believe now I've got to a point in my life where I am, what I would say, fearless but I've had to really, really work to get to that point. Good girl, come on. When I think back to that time, I don't remember living in harmony. Like, I don't remember any fun times. 
I suppose because the negativity has clouded it in a way. The negative times and the scary times have blocked anything that was good. I remember it was quite late at night, you know, probably a school night, lovely way to go to school the next day. Um, my mum running down the stairs and opening, like, crying and, and running out of the house. And my brother and I were sort of, like, pushed back and then he chased my mum down the road and thinking, God, run for your life, just keep running. I was hoping she'd get away and he caught her. And by this point, me and my brother were both on the side of the street and we could... And he caught my mum and, and he started attacking her on the street in front of us. That's my worst memory. I think that's probably the image that I've always carried. Yeah. so weird, you know. I am 31 years old and I haven't cried about it for so long. <sighs> but it was very scary. I believe that I'm healed and I've dealt with it. So it's really weird that I feel it like this. Because it's a bit, I don't know. I think when you, you know, when you, when you see the person that you love the most in the world get hurt, there's no, there's no, you, it's hard to talk about. When you're a child, you're a product of your environment. You don't have a say in who's your parents. You don't have a say in how you're raised, so you have to just deal with whatever comes your way. And... For me, it's the, 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 the pain I feel isn't for myself, it's more for my mum. But my mum's OK now. You know, my mum's a very beautiful person and also um, very, very spiritual, very deep. And, you know, she's happy and has had a wonderful life, you know, for the last decade. And it's, it's all good. But I think for, it's just hard for me to talk about it in detail because it's my mum. And I know that she was suffering, you know. I don't think it's ever easy for anyone who's been through domestic abuse to talk about it, but I'm hoping that through hearing what I and other people experienced as children, others may feel encouraged to speak out too. Kelly, now 25, lived with domestic abuse for eight years as a child. Her mum managed to escape her abuser, Kelly's dad, by turning to a women's aid refuge with her and her two younger sisters over ten years ago. These days, Kelly often volunteers for women's aid and recently raised money for them in a charity run. The domestic violence started a year before I was born for my mum and continued for nine years, so it was eight years of when I was a child that we were in the situation. Kelly is also a full-time nurse. There was always quite a lot of him telling her that she was useless and that um, no one would have her if he ever left her, that she was fat and ugly and lots of emotional abuse. There was quite quite a bit of physical abuse as well. I always used to wait until I felt everybody in the house was asleep before I tried to get some sleep myself. I was quite, quite scared. I've come to a local park to talk to Kelly about what she witnessed as a child. And my mum was bathing me and my sister, so she would have been about 18 months old at the time. She's 18 months younger than me. And my dad was outside fixing his motorbike and he came in and something hadn't gone right with fixing his bike. Yeah. And um, he was shouting at my mum about something going wrong and then he hit her across the head with a spanner. 
I remember my mum screaming and I remember the bath filling up with quite a lot of blood. That's, that's unbelievable. As, a, of your, like, as one of your first things that you ever remember. And how long did... Like, how often would he be abusive to your mum? It, it always varied because my mum left on quite a few occasions, so each time she left, it would go a little bit longer before it happened. I got involved in it quite a lot. Would stand in the middle of, of the violence and try and. I felt like. You'd stand I, in the middle of your mum and dad? I felt it hit her over me and. like I wasn't there, but my mum was always quite conscious that I was there. And I always used to feel that it was reduced if I was in the middle of it or if I tried to stop it. So I never used to like staying out. If I was out playing, I'd keep coming back to check that a row hadn't started because that's how it'd start. When you look back on it, it it's, it's definitely affected me now as well. Not being able to stay out, it's kind of stayed with me. A few years ago, I struggled to stay out of the house. I, I, I couldn't explain what it was, only, only then that's what it felt like when I was younger. You seem very bright, intelligent, positive person. And I know that you ran for Women's Aid, I know that you're a nurse. How have you managed to channel your energy in that way and, and it's not hindered you? I feel positive in the sense that we got out of the situation and we were able to move on with our lives. What was that defining moment when your mum finally decided to leave? On the final night, there was a lot of violence. Um, I could hear him starting to shout at her, so I went into the, my little sister's bedroom. Were you eight at this point? Eight, so. yeah. And my youngest sister was three, and me and my middle one shared a bedroom, and the youngest one had her own room. I went and got her and put her in my bed because I knew something was going to happen. And then the violence came into my bedroom. I think it was my mum trying to get away. He came into the bedroom and was fighting her with a chair. Hit she... her with a chair in our, in our bedroom in front of the three of us. Was what, she was using the chair to try and stop him, or he just brought the chair in? To... The chairs were from our desks in the bedroom. She'd picked one up to shield herself, and then he'd picked one up to, to hit her with it. Oh and I, I remember the two, two girls crying and screaming, and my mum picked up the youngest, who was three, and ran out the house with her across the road to um, our neighbours, who, who was an off-duty police officer, and was shouting for me and my other sister to follow. And the two of us followed in our pyjamas across the road to the police officer's house. That's when we were housed in a... I think we went to, a, like, a police um, bed and breakfast kind of place that night. And then that's when the Women's Aid Refuge were involved and they helped us move. And that was the last time yeah. you saw him that night? Wow. I never spoke to him for about... 12, 12 years, 13 years, and then he recently got in touch with my mum to apologise. It made me think that I wanted to hear his side of the story what, and why everything happened. And so I contacted him a few months ago, and that's the first time I spoke to him. And, and we, we talked about things that he was now going through in his life and help that he was seeking. and problems that he'd experienced in his childhood. So did you suddenly start to understand maybe why your dad is the way that he is? Yeah, I don't think anything's an excuse for, for what happened and, and what he did to my mum. I don't actually think I'll ever be able to forgive him for that. But it's made me understand a little bit that he had his own problems that he never sought help for. So has that been quite cathartic for you, having that phone call and having that conversation yeah. to try and put some sort of sense to the madness? Yeah, I think definitely, because I, I felt a lot of bitterness for such a long time towards him, mm. for a long time. I never, I've never let it eat me up as a person, but I've always, if anybody would speak to me about it, I was always very bitter about him and what he put me through and my sisters and my mum. I think now I've got a little bit of closure on that for myself just to be able to see a little bit more for what it was. Kelly's a fantastic example of somebody that's 
turned a negative situation around for the best and I think that that's wonderful. In speaking to her father, Kelly learned things she had never known about his own background. You've got to always question why someone acts a certain way, especially if it's a violent way. That are in position that you I hope so. <laughs> Thank you. I think anytime anybody is abusive, you have to look at where they've come from. You know, there's a reason for everything. And I believe that if a child is out there at a young age bullying people on the playground or just being generally quite rude and obnoxious, you have to look at their background. You have to look at, you know, where they come from because you, surely nobody's born born like that, you know, you have to be programmed that way or you have to be witnessing or seeing something that isn't of that isn't that isn't good or healthy um, to be able to for these children to go out and reenact it. Bang, bang, bang. Then shut the door in the bedroom. Then they fight. I believe the imprint of what goes okay. on at home will be left on all of the people living there. Yes, I think children can pick up a lot from what they see and hear. And no. you wonder what the effects of witnessing domestic violence might be. Ow. Your parents are your first and foremost role models and what they teach you and their morals and their fibre is what's in you and that's what you project. You know, when I was five years old and my dad wanted me to be an accountant, I went to school and said I want to be an accountant, but I hated math. So it's the classic example of what parents say goes until you re-educate yourself and find your own find your own identity. So I think definitely when we're looking at stories in the media or we hear about children that are out there abusing or being aggressive, we have to take into consideration where they've come from. Camilla Batman Gellidge is chief executive of Charity Kids Company. She is currently working alongside some of Britain's top neuroscientists to examine why some abused children go on to abuse and others do not. Together they are looking into how experiencing abuse can affect a child's brain and behaviour. In her capacity as a psychotherapist, I'm hoping she may give me an insight into this area and possibly into how it may have affected me as a child compared to other children who have witnessed abuse. I'd say both my brother and I would carry a lot of aggression within us and I do think we did probably handle things differently but we both were carrying around the same feelings. Makes me feel like a kid again mm. being in here. I know, it's a beautiful room. But there's a sense of safety mm. in here. It's a very special room because you have so many children's lives yeah. recounted here and you know in the chair you're sitting I often have children and mm. the one thing that stays with me always is their courage is amazing. So you see kids who've seen their mother's head cracked open with a machete. You see um, children who've, who've had to jump age 10 between two adults who are stabbing each other and oh. got splattered with the blood. So a lot of horrific violence seen by the children and survived by them. In all these years that I've worked with children, I have not found a violent child who wasn't violated years before. Exactly. Violent children don't come out of the cot mm. violent. Mm. You know, they're not... They're a product of their yeah, environment. Absolutely. And yeah. that's what our brain research is mm. looking into, is trying to show the public what you do to a child actually leaves imprints. It creates neuronal pathways. So the more violent you are, the more pathways for violence you create in their brain. What happens to children who see a lot of violence and are exposed to a lot of violence is really complex. And uh, if they're in that situation of violence for a very long time without relief, then quite dramatic changes take place in the way their brain functions, in the way their fright hormones flush around the body. And I, I wondered whether you have any memory of that feeling of fear I remember feeling helpless. Helpless. Did you have this feeling of dread? As if, when was it going to happen? What was going to happen? Was that with you? Yeah, I'd say it's interesting now, at 31, I feel very fearless in my life. But I spent a majority of my life being very scared of many things yeah. and very insecure and not yeah. particularly confident. Yeah. But I feel like I've worked through that now. 
the one thing that happens to children who are in situations of domestic violence, either witnessing it or being exposed to it, is they're constantly frightened. Even when the horrible things aren't happening, the child is wondering, when is it going to happen next? Right. What will happen so you're, next? It's like you're preempting it, you're expecting it to happen. With it. So why haven't I gone on to be, beat somebody up or be aggressive? Why am I so resilient? Well, there are two types of children in extreme violence. One group have had really good attachments, i.e. someone in their life has really loved them and cared for them, and they happen to be in a violent situation for a short period of time. Those children recover very well because, in effect, that early love and care that they've had has made their brain very resilient. Right. So we need the front of our brain to calm down the emotional parts of our brain that are deep inside the brain. Right. And most of us balance ourselves out. The real challenge comes from children who have had very poor attachment, i.e. the significant carer was so horrifically abused and neglected themselves or was in constant situation of violence so they couldn't concentrate on their baby. Ooh. Those children find it much more difficult to recover from situations of extreme violence and they're the ones that really need the very specialist programs yeah. to help them a build up their frontal lobe ability their ability to calm themselves down but also deal with the trauma mm. that is stored in the emotional parts of the brain <laughs> I personally believe that if a child felt they would be supported in speaking out, they would find the courage to do so and change their situation for the better. Paul is a 13-year-old schoolboy who turned to a local voluntary organisation for help. He now feels able to talk about what he experienced. My dad definitely made us feel as if we couldn't speak to anybody. He never made me feel safe in the house. It was like a place we didn't feel safe at all. You were always living in fear of him and what he was going to do next. And it was never a nice way to live. Paul recently started working with an independent domestic violence advisor, otherwise known as an IGVA. This service can be accessed through local authorities, voluntary organisations or your GP, depending on where you live. Paul and his sister regularly saw their dad abuse their mum and this abuse was eventually yeah. turned on them as well. His name and details have been changed in order to protect his identity. So when your dad lived with you, the control seems to be the thing that is yeah. the biggest thing, right? Swearing at you and shouting at you and just making you feel really low. Or he'd hit or send you in the corner for hours on end quite often, along with the hitting, which is also quite often as well, more often than not, I would say. He had to know friends were coming around, and when they were coming around, and, and he had to be there as well. And was getting told off something that happened on a regular basis for you? Yeah, it was, that was, that was normal. I was just this, person that was always in his way and um, was never really wanted by him. I was just this nothing that was his son. Was your dad also violent with your little sister as well? Yeah. Yeah. She used to get slapped quite often. And she'd get shouted at and swore at. Obviously she didn't know what any of the words meant, but... Mm. She knew they weren't nice. Mm. She knew that they weren't nice. Tell me the sort of things that he would try to control specifically. 
Um, we weren't allowed to cry inside the house or around him or around would, would anyone. Would you start crying and then he'd tell you to stop? Or would you um, get in trouble for crying? We'd get in trouble for crying. If we were crying, then we were asked to stop. And if we didn't stop crying, then we'd probably just get hit. So you basically were having to bottle up everything. You couldn't let go, you couldn't express yourself. No. So how did you feel towards your mum when it was going on? Did you feel protective or did you blame her? I mean, how, how did you feel about your mum? Well, I, I felt very good about my mum. She obviously loved me a lot because um, she's, she protects me, mm. still does. Mm. And yeah, she, she was always there for us. My mum would try and get me out of the house and to my friend's house when my dad wasn't there because otherwise I would, normally wouldn't be allowed to go. But um, I presume that she'd probably have paid the price when I was out. I can't imagine somebody telling you, don't cry, and having to hold, being so young and emotionally immature that you, that's the, the most natural thing to do is to want to cry and somebody taking that away from you and you feeling like if you do cry, you're gonna get in trouble. Where does that emotion go? Max is now 14. Between the ages of six and nine, he witnessed his mum being abused by her partner. The emotional effects of this abuse are still very close to the surface. He'd come home drunk and he'd just flip for no reason, literally nothing. My nan and my granddad um, knew what was going on and a few people down the road knew what was going on, but apart from that, not very many people. If he kicked off, I knew to um, like run my nan and my granddad um, so the police could come and sort him out. He'd always come snivelling back saying, sorry, I won't do this. And then two minutes later, he'd be at it again, having a go. Whilst Max was growing up, he never knew when the abuse was going to take place, only that it definitely would take place. There was times when I'd be in bed really late and I'd wake up to sort of hearing, hearing what was going on downstairs. There's this thing, uh, Night Terrors, Mm. And um, it was because of him that I had them. And, um, <clears throat> and I had to have an antibiotic called anatriptyline um, that could get me to sleep. And um, I was falling asleep at school sometimes. And did you have a sister or a brother? Not at the time, but towards the end, um, I had a little... My mum was pregnant and had a little sister. So at the time, you were on your own in the house? Yeah. Did you feel abused yourself? Um, Mentally, because I couldn't do anything to help my mum. Um, all I could do was ring my granddad or my nan or someone like that. Um, a lot of the time I was just really scared that if, if what, what if, like the what ifs, really. Um, were the police called out quite often? Um, there was quite a few times they were called out. Who And who would make that call? Um, sometimes I would. Really? Um, yeah, I think I did a couple of times. Um, and, um, like, my nan or my mum, the weird ring. What was the, 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 the final straw for your mum? What happened for your mum to finally put an end to this and get away from this person? Um, well, it was when she was thrown down the stairs by him um, with my little sister in her, in her arms, and she was only four weeks old at the time. Oh my God, I can't even... Yeah, when that happened, um, my mum put uh, an injunction out on him, mm. um, a six-month injunction, I think, and um, there was a particular police officer um, that sort of made mum come to terms with... <clears throat> it was either going to be she'd come hurt, he'd be called out because he'd hurt my mum really badly or mm. something like that. Um, mm. And I think my mum was made to realise that she needed to get out of what was going on. Did you feel safe at yeah. that point? He made me feel very safe. He was the only police officer that I felt I could talk to properly um, about it. He was really there for me. Um, he really like gave me that push to feel confident around the police. Um, mm. Like a lot of kids today, they don't like the police. They hate them. That's true. Yeah. He was one of the main reasons, and still is today, that I want to become a police officer. And have you 
in terms of like channeling your anger, have you had much, would you say, or have you been quite passive throughout this? When he um, threw my mum down the stairs, I kind of lost it, and for that one reason, I'll never forgive him. The thing that upset me the most listening to him talk was when he described the final incident before the ex-partner was separated from his mother, and that was when he threw her down the stairs while she was holding her four-week-old baby. And I don't think that's still... I don't think I've quite digested that. I mean, he's told me, and it sounds horrific, but I don't think I've quite taken that on board. A four-week-old baby, he could have killed that baby. And then you're dealing with murder. 20 years ago, it would have been rare to hear a police success story like Max's. Back then, the government didn't treat domestic violence as a priority, and children would have been more likely to turn to Santa for help than the police. When I heard and saw the things I saw, I never even thought about calling the police. I was too little and too... I don't know. I just didn't think about calling the police. All I was thinking was, leave my mum alone. Nowadays, it's a different picture. Although the police may not get it right all the time, they are more aware than ever before of domestic abuse. A domestic violence call-out today is often referred to as a Code 1 incident, which means it will be treated as top priority. But how does this translate to the front line? I'd like to find out. A patrol team from Avon and Somerset Constabulary have kindly agreed to let me join them on one of their shifts. Their region covers both rural and urban environments, so it offers a snapshot of the rest of the country. Across the UK, the police respond to one domestic abuse call every minute. Some more serious than others. I have no idea what the person counts today. Is this quite a busy area? Action in terms of you know domestic call outs is it quite common around here? It's very common, it's the residential area. The police station is situated right in the heart of the residential area. Oh, okay. And um, because of that, the majority of our calls on a daily basis are for domestic violence and abuse situations. And this is daily? Daily, yes, every day. Very juvenile, possibly adult. And what about children? How common um, is that? Like for the children to have either witnessed it or to have been abused themselves? Um, in this area, I'd say half of the, the uh, domestics we intend children will be in the property um, having witnessed or heard. You could argue that actually every child we go to who is in the house has been abused yeah. emotionally or neglected uh, in some way. Um, I, I think the public associate domestics with, with physical violence and it's important that, that they know it's not physical. It, it, you know, some of it's physical. Um, and a lot of the complaints we get physical, but it is very much emotional as well. You know the children are affected by it. Okay, one domestic, Avenue. Yeah, come to you, This is the domestic now. This is a um, domestic incident that's taken place at a location. It's ongoing at the moment, it's quite a great one. At the moment, it sounds like there's uh, been going on, there's ongoing abuse that's been happening in the past. Have you been to this before? Uh, I haven't personally, no. Yeah. You want to go up to the roundabout with the block five? And... It sounds like it's two men. Yeah, it does, yeah, I think it is. It's possible this is a domestic between two men. Oh, okay. It is quickly established that the domestic incident is between two men living in the same house. No children are involved and one man is arrested. What had happened then when you got into the house? There's two male occupants, uh, both in a relationship with each other. Oh! Um, 
one of the uh, mail from outside having called us himself uh, to state that there had been an incident. We also had a call from neighbours stating that they could hear an incident. Um, they, their neighbours say they could hear someone being strangled. When we've gone into the address, uh, we've located uh, one of the parties up in the um, living room area with injuries to his neck. Oh. He's got um, slight scratch marks that are bleeding on his uh, neck. And um, he's stating that nothing has happened, it was an accident. But with the evidence we've got from neighbours and the injury that we've seen, we know something's happened. Well, that was one I wasn't expecting. No. Um, just for the sheer fact that it wasn't that I didn't think that that happened, but it's men that mainly commit um, domestic violence towards women. Yeah. There, there's the, the case that you get today, a man committing domestic violence against his male partner. Yeah. The Home Office says that 89% of domestic violence victims will be women and only 11% will be men. So this call-out is pretty unusual. Hello? 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 This is an original recording of a Code 1 call received by police over three years ago. I'm about to meet Jessica the girl who made the call, and her mum, Mary, whose voice you can hear on the recording. Jessica's mother was being attacked and strangled by her father at the time the call was made. They have been supported by the NSPCC since the near-fatal incident took place. Names and details have been changed in order to protect their identities. One of his favourite pastimes was to... Was to throttle me, basically. His hands around my throat and he, and he would keep saying, die, you see the C word. And that night he beat me so much and then he started throttling me and, and he kept throttling me and kept throttling me and I fought him off as much as I could. And, but he got me so weak and so, you know, I was literally, he had me in the bedroom and he was throttling me and I was passing out. I could feel myself going and he wasn't losing his grip. <laughs> And, um, you know, in the background, I heard, hello, this is the police, and he let loose his grip and tried to stop him coming into the bedroom. I absolutely believe I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for my daughter. She saved me. What was it about that specific incident which made you have the courage to pick up the phone? I just thought that night it was getting so bad, and she was just there on the floor. My dad was over her, like, throttling her. I was just so scared, so I ran back into my room and I just thought, it's got to stop. So I, I picked up the phone and, and I called the police and they kept me on the phone until they actually got to the house. The door was unlocked, which was good, and the police came up the stairs and I knew that it'd be all right. So I went back into my room uh, and just kind of stayed there and I cuddled the dog to give me some sort of comfort. And um, how did you find the police? Were they very supportive and helpful? It's just been really great. I mean, they've they've given me strategies on how to cope with school and if anything gets out, and it's just made me it's just made me realise how much help you can get, and that never never be hesitant, too hesitant to to ring for help or just to ring the police. Is that your message to other yeah. children that are experiencing yeah, domestic just violence? Yeah, don't hesitate to pick up the phone. So, how old were you when the abuse started? I think I noticed it when I was about 10, but the first time I saw any physical violence was when I was about 12. I would mostly notice it when I was about to go to sleep, so I tried to block it out just so I could fall asleep. Do you ever remember feeling um, like you could say something to your mum about how you felt when you were younger? I mostly kept it all inside. I was always paranoid. I got more paranoid as I got older because I started to understand more of what was going on. Do you remember how you felt about your mum? I never resented my mum for anything. I just grew more pr protective of her and mm. I grew more worried about her. Mm. There were some times when I would think, why is she letting him do that to her? Uh, but then 
As I got older, I sort of understood it was the only way to calm him down. And he used to get me in front of my mum and he would ask the question to my mum, who do you love more? And just to, just to keep him calm, she had to say him. But then my mum would come while he was away and say that it wasn't true. And so to you, Mum, I wanted to ask you, you know, how long were you with him before your daughter was born? Uh, just over a year. And was he abusing you before your daughter was born? Um, looking back, yes, it was, um, it, it was emotional abuse prior, but he first hit me when I was pregnant. It was about, probably about six months. Before I met him, I would have, uh, I would have said, why does that woman stay with that man if I knew about it? What's the matter with her? But they, but they weave this web around you and there's lies and there's deceit, there's constant undermining. You know, he would say to me, I'm the only one that cares about you, I'm the only one that loves you. Did you believe that? At my lowest step, yes. There were many occasions when my husband would try to use my daughter against me. For instance, you know, when we were fighting, when she was very small, he would go into the kitchen and cut himself, and then he'd go upstairs, he'd drag her out of bed and say, look what your mother's done to me. He would do things like, um, you know, if I said I was going to leave, I was going to get away from him or yeah. whatever. He would, um, he would tell me that, uh, that when I came home from work, he would have taken my daughter and would have disappeared, or that he would kill her and, you know, to take it further on the night um, that she called the police. Um, and that particular night, he, I'd, I'd been, it was a sustained beat. It started about 10.30 and it went on until about the early hours of the morning. The, the reason um, the front door was unlocked was that he'd attempted to rape me and he'd made me take all my clothes off. And I'd managed to get away from him after he'd hit me. And I'd managed to unlock the front door and run down the drive. And then he came to came to the front door and he shouted down the drive, that's okay, you go, I'm going upstairs to kill her. And was there a point that you actually believed he was capable of hurting Absolutely, him? absolutely. And you know to this day I believe he would. Um, he made so many threats and he beat me so many times. Um, and as the years went on he started to become more aggressive towards my daughter. Right, so you felt like it was building it up? It was building up, yes. When she was young it was, yeah, I, I think he could control her but it was, you know, it was sustained, um, emotional and, and um, verbal uh, abuse, which was in many ways worse than, than the physical because it was it was constant. And watching your daughter, you know, grow up, you know, if there's any women out there that have got children and they think, well, my child's not being physically abused, so they, they're OK, what would you say to them? I would say I thought that I was keeping it away from my daughter. And I thought what I was doing was protecting her. I wasn't protecting her. The mental torture that girl went through was painful, absolutely painful, so it had to stop. It absolutely had to stop, because it doesn't go away. I think the relationship between the mother and daughter is very strong. It reminds me of the relationship that I have with my mum. And actually, I see a lot of strength in her mum, as I did in my own, because in order to leave and to finally put an end to something like that, you have to be a strong person. And that's inspirational for, for the child to see. There's a lot of women out there that are petrified, but they prove to me that if you can push through that and just be brave enough to say something, pick up the phone, tell somebody, that there is a support system out there that will help you navigate your way from the situation. What's more, if we can learn to spot the signs of domestic violence early on, then we may be able to reduce the number of extreme cases like Jessica and Mary's. The government recently launched a £2 million ad campaign designed to help teenagers recognise abuse within their own relationships. This followed a study by the NSPCC at Bristol University, which suggested that girls aged 13 to 17 had experienced physical violence from a boyfriend and a third had been pressured into sexual acts they didn't want. I've come to a sixth form college to see how a group of students react to an ad from the campaign and to see if I can get them talking. So did you win at football then? Yeah, of course we did. Well, because you're the best? Yep. Yeah, I thought so. So, uh, do you want a bit of fun before your parents get back? Doing what? You know, just a bit of fun. Oh, let's just watch this. Oh, come on. I'll tie everyone you frigid. Well, why would you do that? Well, you basically are being now. Well, no, not really, because we've already done it. Yeah, but you said we would tonight. 
Then you drag me over here and now you say it's not up. Let's just watch this, alright? I don't know my mum's gonna be back. No, I don't want to. No, I don't want to. How about a cuddle? What always happens at the end of a cuddle? Well, who's that? Nicole. Oh, you and your mates. What are you doing? That's your fault, that. I've only just got this. <gasps> don't talk to me like that. And anyway, why are you talking to Nicole? You know I don't like her. So I'm not even allowed friends now, I'm not. You've got arms, you mate. Can you please just look at me? You really hate me. Look at you. You're pathetic. Please, can you just let go of me, all right? No, I'll do it. You're going to have to put some work in to get me ready now. Well, go on then. Show me something. So, do you think it's ever OK to hit a girl? No. No, no, no. I think you can only, like, run away from that sort of situation. I mean, there's no point of using physical violence. I mean, it's just going to get worse. It's just going to escalate and kind of snowball out of control, so you just need to get out of that situation. So, within a relationship, can you li list me some of... some things that you think makes a controlling relationship and how somebody controls somebody within a relationship? Saying, for example, you're not allowed to talk to this person. I don't want you to hang out with them. Mm. OK, so not being allowed to let them see their friends. Yeah. Yeah. I think when a partner friends, another partner saying, I'm going to leave you, blah, 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 Mm -hmm. that's, that's also another way that they can control Manipul them. Manipulating yeah. them, yeah. And they say, oh, I'm going to leave you. Like, no one's going to want you. If. Yeah. 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 No one's not going to want you. I'm the only one that wants so you. So put downs. Put yeah. downs is another way of controlling. Like, I'm trying to control what someone wears as well. Yeah. That's, uh, that's... So they'd be like, you're mine. I don't want anyone seeing your Cover. skin. By the same time that comes down as trust as being well. scared um, that someone else is going to go up to them and say, oh, you look really pretty, you're really nice. Right. Can I they have your number? They don't want other people They want them to be just for themselves. Yeah. Do you think the mental abuse is even worse sometimes than the physical? It's worse. It's worse. Worse. It's worse. It's worse. In what sense? Because it allows like me to do a lot of things. Yeah. You seriously yeah. think about it. What my partner, the work, person I loved, like mm. this, they said this. You to start me. to question: and Does that person really love yeah. me? Like, am I really? You start to feel a bit worthless. And do they yourself. actually mean it? Mm. Why are they still with me? And have so, no self-esteem. Yeah. Yeah. So if somebody's in a relationship where they're being disrespected, the, there's domestic violence going on. Even if it's mental, not not physical. How important is it to find your voice and to say something or to speak to somebody about it? If you do talk to someone, then you might be able to help yourself and progress in life and yeah. make something out of yourself. Mm. I also think that people that's being abused, they forget to speak to their family, who's, like, always been mm. there for them. OK. I don't I think I speak for myself here, but I think it's best that there should be groups and stuff, um, people, other people outside your household to talk to you. It's the embarrassment thing, yeah. right? Yeah. You don't want to tell your family because it's embarrassing, so it's yeah. easier to talk to a stranger than it is to talk to somebody that's yeah. embarrassing for you. Sometimes people that's need helpful. a little push, like yes. not a shove, like a little yeah, push. Just, like, a little just to help. let them take that little baby step to be really? like, yes, I can get over this, yes, I can do this, I'm yeah. not worthless kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you know. Yeah. They yeah. 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 and numbers, but in schools, in all the colleges, universities all around the UK. What about childbirth? You can call that if you're if you're experiencing like sort of domestic violence even within relationships and stuff, right? Or, or like, Would a teenager think, oh, I need to ring childline? My boyfriend's controlling yeah. me. Even a thirteen-year-old or a fourteen-year-old wouldn't go and call the childline. Yeah. They really you know think I mean? they're an adult. Do you want to know a fact? Do you want to know a fact? Most people that are abused are abused around thirty-five times before they actually tell someone. It gets yeah. more than that. Scary. Scary. Yeah. It's enough. When you raise a debate and you talk about something, it pushes the awareness to the forefront of their minds and they'll probably be looking out maybe for friends now, looking out for signs, and I, I have a feeling that if anything did arise in their lives or with friends of a domestic violence nature, that they probably wouldn't be scared to say anything anymore. Now I'm going to start talking to my friends about it. Start, you know, putting the point across because I never actually thought about domestic violence in teenagers. I'm gonna think about domestic ab abuse differently, and I'm also gonna like talk to other people that I think may be in it and let them know what I've talked about today and what I've learned. That's also, also. It's generally um, can be quite difficult to be a teenager because we're all thinking about, um, you know, every every single little thing we do every day. You know, well, my friend doesn't like me anymore, or you know, and and so. Um, we generally want people to like us, you know, maybe we allow a few, like, name-calling and stuff like that, and especially when a relationship is involved. You're finally in a relationship, so you, you know, um, you kind of let things slide when perhaps you shouldn't. 
Children and teenagers need to believe that they will be looked after if they talk to someone. Services such as Childline, The Hideout, Women's Aid and Refuge do just that. I've discovered that these organisations support under 18s and offer a clear route to other child-related services victims may need. As a child, I'd have felt less alone had I known services like these existed, but I didn't have a phone back then, let alone a computer. I've never understood why my mum's ex-partner abused her, and I've never challenged him out of respect for my mum. But I'm really interested in talking to someone who's been in that position, and to find out how and why they could have done what they did. If anybody ever says, you know, the children aren't affected by it because they're behind closed doors or they're not seeing it, then they're clearly deluded. We have to give children more credit, and whether they're physically watching it, or whether it's going on when they're at school, or whether it's going on when they're in the house and it's happening upstairs, they know it's going on. I've arranged to meet David, whose name and details have been changed. In September 2009, David referred himself to a programme run by an independent domestic violence organisation. He has two children with the partner he physically and mentally abused for 10 years. You committed yourself to this perpetrator programme, didn't you? Yes. Um, what point did you have that realisation of, I want to get help? When did you realise there was a serious problem? Um, you know, the emotional welfare of the children, the emotional damage of the children. That's the main aim, you know. For me to get help so that um, I could change. I didn't want the kids to be brought up in that environment. And was it behaviour in the children that Def made yeah, you inspired to do it? She was doing some... Uh, she's got behavioural problems specifically because of my abuse. Right. My aggression and, yeah, right. I, needed, I needed to get help. Did they ever see any of the assaults? Yes. Um, in the same room, in the next room, and it's hard for a child to... to um, they're torn between their parents, you know, the, the mum and the dad, even though they see the dad doing these nasty, horrible things, you know. Mm. They still think, you know, I love my dad, he's doing these things, so it must be right. This must be the way that it is. It was like punching doors. Pushing, pulling her hair, um, you know, just really, really bad stuff. I don't like admitting it because time's gone on, but you, you, you put them down. Nobody's gonna want you. You got kids, look at the way you look, and their self esteem, it goes down and down and down until they're left with nothing else but, but their life. They, they're in, they, they're, they're in a big rut, they don't know how to get out of it. Did you ever ask yourself why your partner at the time never left? Like, why do you think so many women don't leave? It's fear, isn't it? The main thing is fear, you know? I never treated the relationship equal, really, you know? So mm. I was the dominant person. I wanted to be in control. So what was it like for you as a child growing up? Did you ever witness I domestic violence? I witnessed violence? domestic violence. My dad was a typical old-fashioned, you know, you should do what you're told because you're my woman and I'm a man. You know, that's what I was brought up as, see. But I witnessed it with my sister and my sister's partner to the point where my sister would be, you know, um, running naked, uh, screaming up the street. That's how bad it could be. Do you think that things that you saw when you were younger have had an effect on how you were then when you were in a relationship? Definitely, definitely, yeah. It contributed, yeah. When you've got no confidence, you take it out on other people, you know. Um, you want to be in charge. You you want to overpower weaker people. So that's the way you see it. I think you treat people the way you really feel. I treat my partner how I really felt, I suppose, like nobody. And So you projected those feelings onto your partner? It wasn't my partner. My partner was is a good person. And have you now through working with the perpetrator program worked out a way to break that cycle? At first, you have to admit to your problems. That is the main thing. You can't come through it until you've admitted to it. 
and you've held your hand up and said, right, I've hurt these people. The ones that I love more than anything, and that's how it starts. And have you had any feedback from your children since you've been doing the programme? Yes. Um, my son has started to trust me now, you know, because there was fear there before. I, I never saw it, you know, but if I tell him to do the simplest thing, it was because he had to, not because he wanted to do those things, but now it's, it's equal, so. So if you could give any advice to, you know, a perpetrator that's living with children, what would you say to that person? Think about the emotional effect it has on the children, you know, the kids' well-being. Um, it disrupts the growing up, the thought processes. Uh, I know it might hurt, but you, you've got to get out of that relationship. You've got to seek help for your family, for your children. You know, there is help out there. You, you've got you, you've got to push yourself to to, to get the help. He's definitely woken up, and that's what inspired him to want to join the perpetrator program. That's why he took himself there, because he could see the effects it was having on his children and how it was affecting their development. And I think that's the key thing that he hit there for me, was that when children witness domestic violence, it hinders their development and it, and it takes away their, their uh, right to be a child and he's acknowledged that. So it was really good to hear it from his perspective and to really be honest about it. And he made no excuses for his behavior and that was really refreshing. I'd say from the stories that I've heard and all the people that I've met, there's definitely a glimmer of hope, but I still don't feel like I have the solution. So I feel like there comes a point where somebody in a more powerful position than I am has to help, has to take it to another level. The government has already launched its teen violence campaign. Perhaps now it needs to reach out to even younger children who are affected by domestic abuse. Should schools be taking steps to raise awareness on domestic violence? And should awareness around the issue become part of the national curriculum? Our responsibility as adults is to put children first. That's probably why I don't have children yet, because I believe the day I have them is the day I have to be a selfless person and their needs come before mine. And I think that as a society, children's needs have to come before ours. And they're not. They're, they are brushed aside. And then if children do act out or, or go out and commit a crime or, or problems at school, people just wipe their hands of them. I think that there's a big percentage of people out there that don't have the time and patience for children that have witnessed violence or have been subjected to violence. You know, you're not born an abuser. You watch and you learn as you grow up. And a lot of the development in these children has stopped at a young age because they've not been able to, to develop their part of their brain or they've not been able to grow up carefree like most children should be at school, having the time of their lives, looking forward to going home and seeing mum and dad. They're not, they're in hell and they're going home to hell, and it's taken away the innocence of a child. Nothing can change until you come out and say something. As much as you're petrified, as much as you're scared of the consequences, nothing will change until you pick up a phone or tell somebody or confide in someone, because the minute you empower yourself is the minute that you can change your life.